Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's been another interesting week for the Flames, and we're on the heels of trade deadline. One of the best days of the year for hockey fans. As always, I'm Dan, alongside Matt. And Matt, we got a lot to talk about trade deadline-wise. Before we get there, we have three games. Should have had four games, but we have three games to talk about. We played the Leafs twice and the Oilers once. Let's jump into these, shall we? Sounds like a plan. Uh, the Calgary Flames coming off their win against Edmonton on the second. We said, you know what? They beat Edmonton. They can do it. And they had the Maple Leafs come to town, and uh, we were wrong. So on the fourth, the Calgary Flames played the Maple Leafs here at the Dome and ended up losing 4-2 to two in this game. A um, couple notes here. Andrew Mangiapane celebrated his 25th birthday and got a big goal for his birthday. Better birthday present than you got this last week. We had David Riddick in net. And... I mean, those are those are kind of the highlights. I thought personally, the Flames came to life after the early Toronto goal, after that Riley goal. That's yeah. when I thought they looked kind of sleepy for that first minute, and then that Riley goal happened. And it's like that kicked them into gear. Yeah, and it was another instance of just too little, too late, not enough consistent effort throughout, and the better team got the two points. It, I thought it, Toronto looked good for the first 40. I didn't think they looked great in the last uh, no, period. No, but... Uh, but they were able to control the game. Like, it wasn't like Calgary was doing superiorly awesome. Like, the, they managed the game well. The Leafs did, so... Yeah, well, then that's why they're where they are, right? Yeah. And, like, that's kind of how, like, teams should be playing um, in general. Like, if you manage to get a lead, just control the play don't let things get too out of line and you know that the other team is going to be giving a push and you know just manage it a little bit and like the the flames just never really got any footing really and i thought the leafs played well in all three zones i mean so often you see the good teams when they get up they just start, you know, playing offensively, and they sort of let go of their defensive game. But even late, I thought the Leafs knew when to sort of shut this one down and, and start playing the defensive game. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say this, but when I saw Michael Hutchinson in net, I thought, well, this should be an easy one for the Flames. But uh, uh, Toronto's yeah. goaltending has been a surprise all year. Yeah, well, realistically, the Flames should have had a better effort, frankly. Um, but, like, especially on weak goaltending, it's just like when they lost to Gustafson against Ottawa twice in a row. And it's like, really, you're playing one of the worst teams in the league, and, the, like, their sixth goalie or whatever it is, and you still can't get the win, like, really? He was the Freddie Brathwaite of ours that year that we went through every goalie until we found Brathwaite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not much else to say about that game, but we played again the next night. It was a back-to-back, once again playing the Leafs here. This time, we had Blasty Power, as somebody called it, uh, on our Twitter feed. And Blasty Power did us no good. The Flames fell 5-3 to the Maple Leafs. We got goals again from Mangiapane, Backland, and... Well, Backland got two, Mangiapane got one for Calgary's three. I thought that the Flames came out flying in this one. I thought they looked really good in the first, maybe the first half of the first, and I thought both goaltenders looked spectacular in this one. Yeah, and it, this was one where the Flames really needed to find a way to get a goal in the first period, and then they went down to nothing. And to their credit, they fought back, gave up a goal, fought back again, but like they just didn't have that extra gear to push forward and the Leafs ended up just putting it away. Well, I think that's a good point to bring up. I mean, like you said, we went down two two um, goals early, so we had a Spezza and a, and a Matthews goal by 7.53. Then Mangiapane came back and got made it one two to 2-1 going into the break. Then Backlund tied it up 2-2. Two, two. Then Wayne Simmons scored for Toronto. Michael Backlund answered. And it was 3-3, and at that point, we had enough of the game left. I thought Calgary should be able to manage this one. But you got Austin Matthews, you got Tavares, good players, who, sort of like we've seen with Edmonton sometimes, just kind of break through the defense through, I think, attrition at this point. Yeah, it, you just have too many good players and not enough on our end, frankly. We just didn't have an answer, once again, for a team that's better. 
Story of the Calgary Flames, right? Mm-hmm. They they tend to play down to their opponents, but rarely do they play up to their opponents. Yeah, like they're to me like in this one, like especially with the last game being what it was, like they needed to have another gear in terms of skating hard and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing just to have a chance really and i never really got that impression that there was anything beyond what we saw and you know it just simply wasn't good enough in both these games, I mean, Brad Trilliving said it when he fired Jeff Ward. He said, this team has two games, an A game and a D game. And I felt like in both these cases, if we would have even found a B game, we could have won. won. Yeah, we probably would have won both. Yeah, I didn't think they were terrible games. They just weren't enough to get the job done. And sometimes you've just got to find a way. Yeah. Well... Yeah. Um, that was the end of the Flames, I guess, busy schedule for the week, as weird as that sounds, by Tuesday. Um, we One of the Vancouver games got cancelled, because we all know what's going on with the Vancouver Canucks situation there. So the Flames had four days without a game. They, they went Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday without a game, um, which is unheard of, especially in this year's NHL. But a lot of good time for the team to practice, to get things together, and then they took on what was supposed to be um, games got shuffled a little bit here, but what was supposed to be Vancouver became Edmonton because Vancouver is obviously still out. Um, so we took on the Edmonton Oilers on Saturday night, and this was this was a fun game as a Flames fan. I think one of the big stories here: brand new lines, lines in some cases we've never seen before. And Matt, I'll just go through these lines with you here so that everyone's got them, and uh, and we refresh ourselves on where we're at as well. First line in this one was Johnny Goudreau on the left with Elias Lindholm down the middle and Matthew Kachuk on the right. So the Flames trying yet another first line right winger in this one. Um, second line was Andrew Mangiapane and Dylan Dubé with Sean Monaghan in the middle, finally breaking up Goudreau and Monaghan. And Monaghan was, as Daryl said, with the kids. Third line was Milan Lucic, Michael Backlund, and Joachim Nordstrom. And the fourth line, Sam Bennett on the left with Derek Ryan and Brett Ritchie. Even the defenseman got changed up, though. We had Giordano with Tanev, Noah Hannafin and Rasmus Anderson, and Valamaki and Stone. And obviously something worked here because the Flames got a big win, 5 nothing against their provincial rivals in this one. Um, I thought, you know, when I was watching this, I thought, where has this Flames team been all year? That was my thought that kept going through my head in this one. Not just offensively, but defensively. I mean, we... We limited the big shooters in Edmonton. We kept Edmonton only 17 shots. And I thought that every one of these lines looked good. I really especially was liking the Monaghan line. Yeah, and th- this is one of those situations where, okay, we're basically done for the season. Like, we're not going to... Like, unless weird things happen where, like, Montreal loses a bunch of games and Calgary beats Montreal and pretty much every one of their five matchups... The Flames are not going to make the playoffs. So now it's time to figure out, okay, who, what, and how this next season is going to shape up. Because, frankly, we need to be able to sort through, like, is Monaghan being with Manjapane and Dubé a viable line? Is, you know, Gaudreau on that first line? Are you going to keep certain players? Like, there's so many permutations that it you need more information on. And is now Lindholm a, a center or right winger? Yeah, exactly. And now it's a perfect opportunity to work through all of these things because of the fact that we don't know. And might as well experiment and see in hopes of getting more of a plan for next year. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes even just throwing guys off a little bit. I know that sounds weird, but just making you... I think sometimes when you play with the same people, just like when you work with the same people, you get complacent, right? And I think just having these guys working with new guys at practice, learning new tendencies, I think it, it just it made them a little more alert or awake, potentially. Um, and I think that probably helped as well. Yeah, I think so too. And who knows, again, what was done as motivation here. I mean, you know, Johnny and Monty like to play together. We've seen them broken up a few times, and they've said that they like to be together. Maybe this was a case of, you know what, guys, win and I'll put you back together from Daryl. So, you know, who knows if this was being used as a, 
as a motivation tool or not. But, I, you know, I think it worked out well. I mean, we have a lot of pieces in this lineup, and even guys like Nordstrom, Richie, you know, sort of our extra pieces, I thought looked good in this one as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, I did like the defensive pairs, too. I mean, we, we saw our second pair in this one, which was Hannafin Anderson. That was kind of our pair from last year, those two. But I thought that Giordano and Tanev, that they really looked like a veteran pair. And going into this season, I told you that's the, the two guys I'd put together. And I thought in this one, maybe don't put them together five on five, but I can see those guys playing more in special teams because I thought you could just tell that they were both really good vets. Yeah, I agree. And... Um... It's also interesting to see with this, uh, due to the uh, upcoming expansion draft, that likely uh, of the defensemen, Giordano is going to be exposed, um, just for rational sense, because you know uh, Tanev being younger and under we'll probably do seven, longer. three, and one. So that means we get three defensemen uh, protected. Yeah. So you're thinking Tanev, Hannafin, Anderson. Yeah, exactly. And so you also have to see. Can Anderson and Hannafin be a defense pairing, and then say Valimaki play with Tanev next year? That's yeah. kind of well, where because you know that Tanev's basically going to be Tanev, and you don't need to worry about him. Mm -hmm. But it's trying to see if there's some uh, like if you need to go and get a veteran left pairing defenseman, or if you can work with what you've got and just get like another third pairing. Entirely. See, if you're going to go that way, I think I would go Anderson Tanev because they've looked really good, or Hannafin Tanev, I mean, because they've looked really good all year. I'd find a new partner for Anderson, be that Valimaki or someone else. I think someone else, and then leave Valimaki on the third pair for now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but it's one of those things that there are so many permutations that you might, you know, this is experiment mode, and might as well see exactly what, because you never know, like Anderson and. Uh, Hannafin might just have that right chemistry right off the hop. Where well, and they you know, played and together you, a lot last year. Yeah, so you don't know if that will be a beneficial thing or you know, and like this is where sorting out all of these things is crucial for next season. I have an I have an idea for the expansion draft, Matt. We re-sign re Michael Stone for a year. Somehow we con Seattle into taking Stone. Then he goes in waivers, and we bring him back because we can't get rid of the guy. Hey, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like, that that just seems like the perfect story, doesn't it? That they take Stone, they wave Stone, we bring Stone back. It's like, you know, he's never going to go away. The question will just be, do we not tell him when we change arenas? And he just sits waiting in the dome for us to come back. <laughs> this guy's never going to go away. Yeah, well... He's looked good at least thus far this season. So you know he's a guy who you know who didn't really play a lot, got bought out, and has now earned himself an NHL spot. And we'll talk about this another time. But I wonder what it means for Nesterov. Yeah. Well, uh, just to talk about that briefly, like honestly, at this point, I think I'd rather keep Stone and let uh, Nesterov go. In Nesterov's the a free agent. Let him go. The, that's a. Everyone's got a Nesarov. You can either f either fill that internally, or you'll find another free agent to do that. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, if that guy's going to play with Valley, I'd rather bring in a like 32, 33 year old veteran to play with Val with Val and Mackey there. Exactly. But anyway, um, so yeah, those are the new lines, and they uh, ended up working well. We got goals from Monahan, Goudreau, Lindholm, Giordano, and believe it or not, Brett Ritchie. I uh, nice. got the, the fifth goal in this one. So it was all goals in the second, and then Richie's in the third. Um, the biggest thing I thought in this game, why, and one of the biggest, I mean, challenges Calgary's had, how many Edmonton games have we played now where we said we got beat by McDavid? And this one, we kept McDavid off the scoreboard, and Mike Smith didn't look very good. And I think Mike Smith has been surprisingly good for Edmonton against Calgary this year. Yeah, and it's been a litany of factors, but those are the two main ones and you know like if you're gonna get beat by mcdavid you need to find a way to beat the goaltending and they haven't and yeah like it's it's good to get the win though and yeah it, big, it just big five nothing winning against edmonton as we move into yet more toronto or one more toronto game i think hopefully they can ride that high against toronto and montreal well, th this is where we're at now, is that 
with Montreal's uh, schedule, like the next two weeks are absolutely murder for them. They over, including tonight, over the next sixteen days, they play ten games, so they're going to be tired. If they start to actually lose games due to fatigue, and Calgary plays them five times out of those ten games, Calgary can get back into things. But they have to actually play like they did against the Oilers every single game. And, like, without That's exception. The challenge. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, okay, great. You had that in you. Do it again. And but, again. But, you know, at, and the, again. at this point, Matt, if we could do that, we would have done it. Like, I think at no, this I point, know. it's kind of a foregone conclusion. Like, could we do it? Sure. Are we going to? No. Nope. Yeah, no. And, but that's where, like, you know. Ugh. With how the trade deadline went, which we'll get to in a second, that basically was a getting as much value out of this team without really making that much of a difference in terms of the roster. So that way, okay, here's your last shot. Go prove it. That, you know, like if you're wanting to be here, this, that, the next thing. This is your last, last, last opportunity. You do have a shot because Montreal's weird schedule and the fact that you play them five times. It's a tall order. You put yourself in this situation. Go prove it. Why? Or or corresponding moves will be made. And it, it this is literally the last, like, putting it on the players. You respond or changes. And it it's just a, a good evaluation to both make the final verdict of this iteration of the team we all pretty much know what's going to happen like i'd be shocked frankly <laughs> if they pulled it out of their hat but not not only montreal though matt i think also vancouver were were underestimating here they're gonna have a lot of hockey to play and after being you know shut down for 10 days it's gonna take them a while to get back into this too and i mean vancouver's three point two points down on us we're six points down in Montreal, so I think really you have to win, and and the Flames are going to have an easier time winning than both those teams. Exactly, like it, it is everything is in Montreal's advantage, except for the fact that we directly play them five times, and if we don't allow overtime and win at least four or five of those games, Calgary then has a shot because they'll have erased everything. And then it's a jump ball. But this is literally a put it up or, you know, we just make adjustments and, you know, new people and who gives a crap. <laughs> and it, it's a good and fortunate thing because, like, there is no parsing of it. Like, you can't say, like, oh, you did it good enough or this or that. It's clear. Either you make the playoffs or you miss. And Craig Conroy said it well today, I think. He said, we can't keep winning one and losing one. We have to put together a win streak if we're going to do anything. Exactly. So looking at where we are and trying to put that win streak together right now, we're still fifth in the West, or in Scotia North, sorry. I keep thinking the West. I, I've said Pacific a few times, too. But we're in yeah. the Scotia North division. Um, in the we're, in the thing that we play hockey in, <laughs> the, I don't know. I still don't know why we didn't call it the Canadian Division, the Scotia Canadian Division, or the Canadian Tire Division, or something like that. But um, yeah. anyway, what's the what's the name of the guy on the Canadian Tire box? The Sandy McTire or whatever. We could have had a Sandy McTire Trophy. Yeah, for the <laughs> for the Canadian Tire Division. But anyway, um, we we can talk about that on a day on a week when we need more to talk about. Um, Toronto's still at the top with 59. Calgary sitting fifth at 37 points right now. Montreal, 43. They have the final playoff spot, so we're six points down on them. Vancouver obviously now has, uh, has some games at hand because they haven't been playing. They have 37 games played. Montreal's 38 games played. Calgary has 41. And we have 37 points. Vancouver, 35 points. Ottawa, 32. I mean, theoretically, Ottawa's still in this too, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, if they win everything, maybe. <laughs> well, and, and this is the thing I've had to talk to people about this week, is people are like, well, mathematically, we're in it. Yeah, we're in it, but, I mean, if we could do it, we wouldn't be where we were. So math isn't the only story. It's 
you know, look at what we've done this season or what we haven't done this season. Yeah, like, there's 15 games left, and when you have to win 12 or more, the, you could. It could happen. And even then, you're probably the going to be so are, tired, you're not going to win four of the next seven. No, because then you're going to play Toronto and you're going to get murdered. So, It yeah. almost makes you wonder if it's worth it. Although that would be amusing if the Flames got in and then, oh, David Riddick. <laughs> yeah, or if they go all the way and then uh, the the final goal scored by Sam Bennett, but we'll talk about that. Yeah. Well, let's jump there, Matt. So it's trade deadline day. Uh, we thought we said last week we thought the deals would be done by yesterday, and we saw one done late last night. The other one got done today. Calgary had three pieces going into this that we thought might move. Three expiring contracts that were worth anything. Nobody wanted Levo. Nobody wanted some of those guys. We knew that. But we said Derek Ryan, David Riddick, Sam Bennett, probably three pieces that would go. And we saw two of them move. David yeah. Riddick got traded to Toronto, 50% of his salary retained by Calgary. We know that Toronto has some cap issues in exchange for Toronto's 2022 third-round pick. And Sam Bennett got moved today, long after his trade request. Um, it was Sam Bennett and our, 2020 second, our 2022 sixth-round pick to your second-favorite team, the Florida Panthers, for their 2022 second-round pick and prospect, Emil Heineman. And an interesting uh, note on Heineman, Conroy said today, the Flames were really high on Con- on Heineman, and uh, Florida took him just seven picks before us in the last draft. He's a 2020 draftee. So a guy the Flames have had their eyes on for a while and are finally able to bring back. So really, bringing in two second-round picks for Sam Bennett and uh, and a sixth, we got a better return on that than Buffalo got for Rid- for uh, Hall. Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, look at it. You're trading a fourth line center, which is where he's been most of the season, for a second and a guy who just got drafted second. That's a hell of a return. Yeah, exactly. And that's literally a potential value return. And, I mean, I just yeah. I just want to I just want to pause there and say this. And you said this before we recorded too. A lot of people have been ragging on on Tree Living this year and. I've been saying since he came in, I think this is one of the best GMs the Flames have ever had. Same here. And I think that return right there shows you this guy can do magic. I mean, we've asked if he's a wizard. We've asked if he's really the heir to Boston Pizza, if he's the heir to Gandalf the Great, because the man does amazing things with contracts, and I think he's really some sort of wizard. But this shows, I mean, for a guy who who asked for a trade earlier in the season, when do you ever give value for a guy who asked for a trade? You just ship him off for a conditional seventh, and yeah, you're done. Like the only other time that you saw value return was literally the Matt Duchesne trade from Colorado. And yeah. like that was literally the only time. And uh, getting two seconds, like uh, Heineman's a good player. He will play in the NHL. Uh, I, w- I would bet on that just he is extremely fast and he's good defensively so between the two you're at a minimum getting a good fourth line energy player well let's talk a little bit about Heinemann because not a lot of people know him Conroy today compared him to Zach Hyman in terms of work ethic and details but if we uh, take a look at his elite prospects profile here, born in 2001, he's 19. He was born in Lexland, Sweden. I think I have a bookshelf named that from Ikea. Um, he's a left winger, 6'1", 185 pounds, shoots left. Um, and the, the elite prospects draft guide described him this way. He's the type that can fit anywhere in the lineup and play any role. There's a strong push to his stride, which gives him added acceleration and top speed while skating in a straight line. He's always got his feet moving, always maintains a high battle level, and never shies away from making personal sacrifices to improve the two-way health of his team. That sounds like a Daryl Sutter guy, doesn't it? Yeah. It, the sounds like one, a guy with the main truculence. comparable I've heard of is Michael Froelich, and that's basically, from what I've seen of him, a very similar-ish type guy. I don't think that his offense will translate nearly as good as Felix did, where he became a 40-point guy. But definitely a good, solid penalty killer, two-way forward, can jump in the play. And what his offense literally will dictate, is he a fourth liner, a third liner, or a second liner? I mean, the way I kind of look at this is we gave up Bennett for a second and a sixth rounder for this guy. So he's, you know... If he plays even a couple games, we got great value out of him. Even if he's an AHL tweener, I mean, you know, yeah. you, there could still be great value there. Yeah, and then the second round pick, like, 
honestly, the second round pick, that's a good value. And the Flames, in their recent history, any picks really in the top 90, they've pretty much hit on most of them. So, uh, well, any more bullets you get in that gun, great. And not only picks, we've seen Tree do amazing trades with picks. And what I like about this is he buys himself some currency. Right, if he wants to trade those, I mean, now he's going to have going into 2022 his first two seconds, two thirds at the very least. So it, it gives Tree currency, and maybe we see him move some of those. Maybe we don't, but um, you know, I, I think it'll be. Well, I think especially it, it, it just gives him something to play with. If he wants to make a move, he can, and maybe trades two seconds and moves up, like. Or, or maybe trades him for roster players. It just he he does well when he has currency, and that's what I'm happy well, about. Well, especially here. like with this team being in the state that they're in, they need draft capital more than anything mm-hmm. because you can't like as you mentioned, like Tree did all of the things that he needed to. It's hard to expect a guy who's been a thirty goal guy in his entire career to have like what five goals this season with Monahan. Or Kachuk to completely disappear. You can't anticipate that. No, Tree and, put the right team on paper. Yeah, like this team should have been right up in the top three with the three teams that are there fighting for Got a first. good deal on a goalie. That's another big thing he did. You know, like all of the prerequisites for what the team needed heading into the season, he did. We needed a good defenseman, we needed a good goalie, and we needed to flesh out some depth. He did all of those things. It's not his fault that the two of the four guys that you rely on for scoring just decided to stop being NHL caliber talents for good portions of this season. And it's just frustrating. And, like, that's why the Flames are where they're at. Like, we don't have, you know, five or six or seven top six forwards. Like, we're not. You know, like, who does, really? Like, Mm. uh, the only team that could actually endure this kind of a season is really the Tampa Bay Lightning. And even then, they'd be struggling. And, you know, like, you can only anticipate so much, but it just frees up concepts for different scenarios now with and i everything. i've said about tree in the past and you've heard me say this both on and off the show matt i think one of the things i really like about tree is his ability to admit a mistake right i yeah. mean he brought in guys like brower and he brought a, he bought out brower he admitted yeah. a mistake how many gms do we see that hang on to their own mistakes well, or a well a Mike going Sm- back you know, to uh, a james neal he found a solution too yeah look at uh jay feaster what did he always preach intellectual honesty well that is what true living mm-hmm. has done Entirely. If the guy's not cutting it, he moves them. Yeah. And I don't want to say these guys weren't cutting it, but he was able... I mean, I think there was probably something there with with uh, with Tree Living and Bennett because they came in at the same time. That was his first pick. Highest pick ever in the organization. I think they probably wanted to work out and maybe they gave more leash than he should have. I think that could be debated. But I'm glad to see they said, you know what? The right business move was to move on from... And let's be honest, whether we think he should be better or not, let's move on from our fourth line left winger. Yep, exactly. Right? And this is, like, I hearken back to Dion Phaneuf when I think about Sam Bennett and what uh, Jim Playfair uh, said about him in his season coaching, that Dion Phaneuf is not as good as Dion Phaneuf thinks he is. And I think that Sam Bennett, in a lot of ways, got in his own way in terms of... You know, like, you're playing on the third and fourth line, not because, oh, the coaches have it out for you, but because you're not doing the things that are necessary to actually be more than that. And, you know, like, with all the dumb penalties and the irresponsible Mm -hmm. play. And he didn't figure that out until now, (laughs) and, yeah. I'm sorry things didn't work out better. I think that the organization was frustrated, the player was frustrated, I think there's just a lot of frustration all the way around with Bennett. I'm sorry things didn't work out better, but again, I'm. Yeah. I look at the return and I think, you know what? That was the right move to make. It doesn't mean Sam Bennett will never be a Calgary Flame again. Um, it might mean the end of the Lanny stash. I can't see anybody knowing what that means over in Florida. Uh, if someone asks what's with the mustache, he says, tell them Lanny sent you. They're not going to know what that means. But I, I think that Bennett, and I think the Flames probably got a premium here because Bennett's good at one thing, and that's playoff hockey. And he's going to a team that needs a good playoff guy. 
But I'm going to be interested to see how Bennett develops there. I mean, he's an RFA. I have no doubt they're going to qualify him. Um, and I'm, I have, I look at this in a couple ways. If he turns out to be a great player, I'm glad it's going to be in Florida, not in Edmonton or Winnipeg or Vancouver yeah. or a team yeah. they'll be back in the Pacific next year. I'm glad it's over in Florida if he's going to turn out to be good. Um, but I also, I think that this. There's been a lot of talk about if he was the right fit in Calgary. And if he still doesn't fit well in Florida, I think we're really going to kind of see what Bennett has in him. And if it was a situation of him not developing well in Calgary, or if he's just perpetually a bottom six guy. Yeah. And basically this generation's version of a Rafi Torres. By the way, Rafi Torres, I did make that comparison before. He was drafted fifth overall back when he was drafted so and had very much that mm-hmm. top six ish upside and he just never turned the corner and that's why and I, I think that- to, to Sam's credit he's found a different role for himself right he became yeah. that grinder he became that you know physical guy but I mean he's coming off a great contract year I don't think that anybody's gonna pay Sam Bennett what's he making this year he's making two in a bit uh two in a, I I think this probably the uh, sadly for him and this is probably his best contract year yeah, uh, unless he magically figures something out. But I don't know if he has Arbrights, but I think it's going to be hard to find a comparable for him if well, he does honestly, have Arbrights. Well, uh, honestly, you know, like honestly, I'm not even too sure if Florida qualifies him. Just like Edmonton didn't qualify Anathasiu last year. Like it's yeah. one of those. Like it depends on how Bennett plays, and you know, it it I, is literally I, entirely up to Bennett. And I'm not. I, by the way, I know it came off kind of harsh in like criticizing Sam Bennett there, but it, at the end of the day, like the organization, the players in the organization aren't cutting it, and at, at the end of the day, it's on the players. Like the, there's enough the talent there where you guys should be able to figure it out, and you're not. So that's on you and. You know, if you're having loftier expectations of yourself, well, you know, you have to actually put the effort in to do that. And it, like, that's part of why I've been frustrated about this team in general, because they should be good. And they're not. Here's an interesting question for you. If Florida doesn't qualify him, he goes to UFA. If he drops his price around a million and a half, would you bring him back? Nope, not at all. I wouldn't either. I know a lot of people like him and and all that, but I think Sam Bennett's time as the Calgary Flame is over. Yeah, honestly, I think find somebody else. Honestly, this is one of those where, like now, it, it's literally get new people in. Period. Mm-hmm. And like, even if the Flames move on from Gaudreau, Monahan, Kachuk, Lindholm, any of those players, period. It doesn't matter because we don't know what trades might become available. Blah blah blah. I, I think just getting different people in mm-hmm. and cycling the entire... Because, like, obviously this team is broken in a good number of ways. Just getting new people, they don't have any hang-ups. It's literally like if you're in a bad relationship, sometimes just going and dating somebody else might actually be better for you. And I think especially if we're looking at a fourth-line role, which, again, it's I'm not trying to diminish Sam Bennett. That's where he's been playing. Mm-hmm. I think those are the kind of roles, especially with the cap the way it is. If we can get his salary back for next year, and you know, bring up an ELC, I think ELCs are going to be more and more important. Entry level contract for those that don't know what I'm talking about. I think ELCs are going to be more and more important going forward. And I think that's where you bring up a you know uh, Matthias Emilio Pedersen or Rajishka or somebody who yeah, like why honestly, why are we going out and filling that role from UFA? Well, like, honestly, Ruzitska, who got recalled, like, honestly, I don't see there being any difference in terms of the level of play from what Bennett was bringing to what Ruzitska... Because he's going to be trying to earn that spot, so he's going to be throwing that passion in because, hey, I want to be here next year. I don't want to play in Stockton. I want to be in Calgary. For sure. And, and we need to get more of that youthful energy in. And certain players, like, if you're not wanting to be here, so... I think we all had a lot of high expectation of Bennett. Let's do a bit of a thought experiment here. If Sam Bennett and Johnny Goudreau's draft spots were flipped, if Goudreau became the first-round pick and Bennett became the fourth-round pick, I know they're different years, but let's just say Bennett's a fourth-round pick, do you think we'd all be as disappointed in him? Uh, honestly, yes. Uh, because of the fact that in that first year, he showed that he could generate the offense and play at a better level. 
his best season literally was his rookie year. And it's sort of like when Josh Juris was here. And he had that really amazing rookie year and looked like a legitimate player. And then he disappeared. But I think even with Juris, uh, though, again, not being a first rounder, you kind of go, well, he had a good year. I mean, David Moss did something very similar. And I think at some yeah. point you go, this guy's just having a flash in the pan for one year. I don't, yeah, but, you know, you kind of hope that, like, any time that a player like that comes out, especially like how Sam Bennett did, like, he looked like he was going to be a key contributor, a second-line player, you have that aspiration for him, and then he just doesn't actually progress and regress. He loses all the offense and doesn't progress in any other avenue, and you're going... But I guess when I look at a guy like yeah, Juris like, or Bennett, I mean, if Bennett was a fourth or Juris, who we didn't pay anything for, he was undrafted, I guess you kind of look at it with Juris that we paid nothing for this asset. We got one good year out of it. That's really all you can ask for, right? I mean, true. We're looking, we, you know, and I guess that's where I'm getting with this is if Bennett was a fourth round pick, um, would we have gone, you know what? We got one good year out of him. Maybe we got a couple other, you know, he filled a roster spot. That's what we can ask for from a fourth? Like, were our expectations too high because he was the highest pick in franchise history? Both yes and no. Um, and because maybe, he, maybe because another way to say it is, would, he, would the organization have given him so much leash if he was a fourth-round no, pick? No, no. Like, it, not at all. Like, if he... He would have been gone two years ago, frankly, had he been a fourth-round pick. It's because he actually did fulfill some of that potential that of being a fourth overall pick like he had nearly 40 points and like he he looked like a on his way to being that 60 point good two-way guy and so like there's that expectation of you know because his rookie season was very much similar to sean monahan's and so you're like okay you well you're gonna take that next step and then he just evaporated really And, you know, like, so yes and no, but he just frustrating all the way around. Like, because, yeah, (laughs) it's it's a frustrating story. But to me, it has a happy ending for everybody. The Calgary Flames got value out of the asset. Yeah, I think it gives um, Sam Bennett a chance to show what Sam Bennett thinks he has with another organization. And I think it's it's one of those times it's a happy story for everybody. Let's move on to the other trade the Flames made. Uh, David Riddick being traded to Toronto, 50% retained for for a 2022 third-round pick. I just want to say before we get into these, I like the Calgary traded for both 2022 picks. I think this year's draft is going to be a crapshoot. I'm glad we didn't bring in a pick this year. Yeah, it, this one is going to be weird. Put it this way, I could see third and fourth, fifth round picks being having the same value, like some of the players that you would normally ascribe to a second round guy, just due to like the late bloomers that normally For rise, sure. but we wouldn't have, have gotten the opportunity because this year is just bizarre. Right so now it's... we have seven picks. We have all our picks. We don't have our fourth. We have since third. I'm quite happy with making our seven picks this year and then scouting better for next year. Yeah, and literally if some team said, hey, we want uh, your fourth now, do you mind taking our fourth next year? Bye, fine, sure, Yeah, take or it. even 2023. Yeah, sure, take it, bye. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if this year you don't see a I, I bet you won't see a lot of movement on the draft floor. I don't think a lot of teams are going to want to move up or down. You no, might the see only a few in the very I top could, end. but I The only thing I could see really is like your traditional trade down things where like if a team yeah. really like you know and you get an extra pick but even then i think the extra pick will be for next year not this year but um yeah like i just i don't see uh well well like frankly like this year's draft is a bit weird there's the couple of good guys forwards up at the front of the draft then it's a bunch of defensemen a goalie randomly in there and then more forwards towards the middle of the draft so like frankly if the flames are picking anywhere from basically third to about eighth then expect a defenseman more likely which you could probably use right now yeah or uh dylan gunther that would be the next best forward and he's a right shooting right winger so you know like that's we'll basically talk, let's talk more about that oh, i know when we get but, closer but i just wanted to throw that in there just because 
Um, but when no, you look like, at assets in and out on each of these trades, I think Bennett really it's a first for two seconds. If we look at it that way, a first and a six for two seconds with David Riddick kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier about what the cost was. Riddick's the guy we paid nothing for, right? There's a guy that yeah. we found overseas. We hired out of nowhere. You and I saw him at the first uh, dev camp he went to. The guy barely even spoke English. And now we get a third for him. Again, if you just look at return on assets, I think that was a great deal. I'll give you my take on this one, Matt. Sorry, if you want to keep talking no, about no, the draft, no, no, we no, can. No. But um, I'll give you my take on this. I think we had one trade partner. I don't think Riddick was going to go to the States. I think there were enough goalies stateside that if you wanted a goalie, you would have got one from one of the teams that was in the U.S. We didn't see a lot of the move, but I think there was enough. You probably could have got one for the same price. So I think if we were going to move Riddick, we were going to move him to Canada. I think really if you look around Canada, there's really only one trade partner, and that's Toronto. So I think all things considered, we got the best deal we could out of Riddick, having paid nothing for the asset. And both Tree Living and uh, Conroy said today, he probably wasn't coming back, and you and I knew that as well. This is a guy who you know wants to move on, wants to be a starter, wants to move to another market. So I think all things considered, a third-round pick is a good return, and it lets us see what we've got in the system, whether that's Deming, whether that's um, you know Zaga or uh, yeah Zaga Doolin, whether that's Parsons, it opens up a spot to try somebody out, and I think that's going to be important for next year. So I'm yeah. really happy with this deal. Yeah, exactly. Like I, the way I figured, like the re- remaining 15 games to go is that like the next five will be the Flames trying to make the playoffs. You know, give it that last kick mm-hmm. if they don't basically win all of them or close to, then okay, now it's full-on experiment mode. You'll see the guys like Phillips and Pedersen at Parsons, Zagadulin, like, the, any of I the kids that are... Net. No, just, like, all of the kids from Stockton getting recalled and yeah. trying them all out, giving them time and, and see what they have, sitting some vets. Like, all the extra depth forwards i don't think that like at that point i don't think any of them would play at all it would all be kids all the time and see from that point on and you know so so as of this point craig conroy said he expects louis Deming to be the backup which makes sense i think you want to keep zega doolin and parsons you know going in stockton until you might have a starting spot for one of those guys you don't want to bring them up sit them on the bench and i think you know if we're going to keep playing markstrom markstrom Deming. i mean we talked about you know, Deming potentially getting some games this year. He is a guy with NHL experience. Whether you think he's a great goalie or not, he's, I would say, a serviceable backup. So I have no Joey problem with McDonald, that. Joey McDonald, basically. Like, he can play. He's not yeah. going to be great, but he'll do the job. And- if he's your starter, if we were having so many injuries, there was Deming and Parsons, you're running into issues. But if it's, you know, Marks from Deming, I think you're fine. Yeah, exactly. And, um, like, honestly, like, if the Flames were better... Uh, and like closer to a playoff spot or in a playoff spot, I don't think that Riddick gets. You wouldn't moved Riddick, no. But at this point, you know, you might as well get the asset. If the Flames do miraculously figure it out and get to the playoffs, oh well, you're going to be playing Markstrom anyway, so who cares? At that point, when I saw this deal, I when I saw that he went to Toronto, I don't know why, but before I looked at the deal, I just assumed there'd be some conditions on this one like when i heard it was a third i'm thinking okay it's a third and if he plays so many games it becomes a second but I, i'm i'm not unhappy with a third is the return on this if sam bennett gets you essentially a second you know just in raw draft asset i think a third is just fine for david riddick mm-hmm. and again a guy that we weren't going to bring back i mean you could argue could we afford bennett sure could we qualify i'm sure riddick was going to be gone out the door so you might as well get something for him yeah whether that's, you know, a, a draft pick or a player, and if you listen to what Tree said today in his uh, and and Connie in their press conference, sounds like there was talk of adding a player, but it ended up just being a pick in the end. And, and I'm totally fine with the pick. It's an asset for down the road. We don't need a goaltending asset right now. I think this is again a, a good return, all things considered. Yep, I can't complain. No, I was actually expecting less for both these guys. I was expecting. You know, Riddick maybe a fourth or fifth. Yeah, I was expecting about a second only for Sam Bennett, and basically either a late third or a fourth for Riddick. And, you know, and they got the late third. 
So th that's okay. I'm not, it, frankly, anything at this point. Like, we just need to, like, if the Flames do miss the playoffs, which they're going to, it, it, they just have to start changing out the personnel, period, and, until they get that right mix again. And whether that's via the draft or who they trade or whatever, who cares, just s start cycling bodies out. Because, like, obviously it ain't working, so just mix it up. Another guy a lot of people thought would move, and I wasn't so sure, was Derek Ryan. I think his contract is rich for a lot of teams. I think everybody's got somebody like Ryan, maybe not as good, but I don't know what you pay to acquire Derek Ryan in the draft right now. And again, I think looking at our Canadian teams, Edmonton was maybe the only one that would have wanted to. I think if it, let's just say this, if it wasn't a expansion draft year, I think we would have found a deal to bring back a player for Derek Ryan because I don't know you're getting draft picks for him, but in a in an expansion yeah. pack in an expansion draft year, I don't think the Flames want to add a body just to lose a body. Yeah, and frankly, Derek Ryan is the type of player that if the Flames wanted to say sign him to a three year deal at like a million dollars a year, that'd be great. He's uh, another guy who I think's making the best money he's going to make, just like Bennett. Yeah, like honestly, I think that like. Like, frankly, actually, I would really like if Derek Ryan stayed for a couple of years. Like, he, he's a good veteran in the dressing room. He does his job well. Not really anything. And even if he falls off, it, you know, like, even if you're paying him, like, a million and a half, like, that's not... I, th I you think know. you compare him to Stone that way. Like, Stone was here at, what, like, 2-5, and he wasn't really worth it by the end. That's why I bought him out. But now it's 700000 great deal. Yeah, and exactly. I think you know Derek Ryan right now is making uh, three million one, you know, three point one million. I don't think he's worth that, but like you said, if he'll come back in a million, sure, I'll I'll have Manker my third or fourth line. He's yeah, like thirty four. I don't know. I do a three year at this point. Yeah, well, I'd almost give him the like if you did like a million and a half a year for three years, like you you know you want to keep him a, and you know like that term like even if you had to buy out the last year it's not going to cost you anything so it's I, I don't know you need to do the three years with a guy that old though i mean he's going into his 35 year old season if he retires you end up getting a cap penalty i think i'd start doing just you know million and a half a year and just say we'll keep you as long as you're willing to go yeah well regardless like if the flames do go into a bit of a rebuild ish thing um having a veteran guy like him who does do his thing the right way effectively and gives it his all that's a very good yep. leader by example this is what you need to be to be an nhler and, and that i think more than anything is necessary for this team to point to to say hey play like this guy and i can even see a point if he is on a three year and a year and a half two years maybe you wave him and you send him to stockton give him the c and say you know what here's your leader Here's a guy who's been there and done it. Derek, your job is to, you know, help get these guys ready. Yeah, as you transition into, like, being yeah. a coach or something afterwards. Because I, I get that vibe from him anyway. So that he would be a very good coach down the line if he went, wanted to go that route. I just can't see a lot of teams with that contract this year wanting to take him on as a rental for a draft pick. Like I said, if there was an expansion draft, I think a lot more would have been done overall if there was no expansion draft. But I think you would have got a player of some kind for Ryan if not an expansion draft. But I don't think you were going to get a pick in yeah. this market. So I'm okay to hang on to him. Matt, overall though, how would you out of 10, how would you rate the Flames deadline day? Uh, about an 8, 8.5. Eight um like there's not really much more you weren't going to do a Johnny to, Goudreau deal at the deadline well you also have to manage that like the, the Flames do still technically have a shot at the playoffs just due to Montreal's weird schedule and the fact that we play them five times and you do kind of owe it to the players uh, you know because they've been here to allow them the final say it, you know because either they will find that in them and they will make the playoffs or they won't and then you don't care about them anymore in terms of planning for the future it's then a part of, it moves on to the stage of figuring out 
who, what, how, and what next for this you organization. Said, you said about eight and a half. What what could they have done to make it a ten today? Uh, probably trading off one or two more things for like a depth pick or something. But but yeah, I mean, re- looking realistically though, what are you going to get for for our other UFAs? What are you going to get for Levo? What are you going to get for Richie? What are you going to get for Nordstrom? Well, realistically, like uh, uh, the only guy that really would have moved is Derek Ryan. Where, like, I can understand that they didn't, but you know, getting a sixth or a fifth for Ryan would have. But helped. even when I look- and I I understand why they didn't, and like especially if they keep him, because I would actually like them to keep him moving Can forward. Just trade him and bring him back, do the old Ole Jokinen. Yeah, it, it's just one of those things that I'd rather keep him if possible. So if they, yeah. you know, so it, if they retain him it, after the fact, it, I'll bump it up. But, you know, I, I just would be a little annoyed that they didn't get anything for him because he could have, they could have got at least an asset for him. I well, I feel. guess I look around at the deadline. I say, what's kind of the comparable deal I wish we could have done? If Michael Raffle can get a fifth, Derek Ryan could get a fifth. Like, there was a lot of defensemen moving, but not a lot of forwards for picks. Like, um, yeah. Raffle was kind of the only one. So I think, you know, Goddard for Highmore, like, there was player for player, but I'm not seeing a lot of older forward for player here. So I think maybe there was just no market for that. Yeah. Which. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it, it's splitting hairs. Like, it, yeah, all all things considered, like the Flames did pretty much what they needed to, in terms of the context of now, because you're at least giving the team as it is the the final say for this season. Yeah, and then you know while you're making the plans for next year, because you're you you know like any rational person's not expecting this team to make the playoffs, and you know like they're they're done. But you're giving the the Flames players the last shot to f- finalize that and cement it into stone, and then carry on with the next stages, which is looking at like Goodrow, Monahan, Kachuk, Giordano. Uh, to whatever, me, it's got whatever. nothing. To, it's got nothing to do with the players. You know, having one last shot. To me, it's there's no market to make those big moves now. I think you. We all knew those are going to be off season moves, anyways. So why not just save them for the off season? There's no need to make that move now. And we saw. I mean, if if we got more for Bennett than Buffalo got for Hall, I'm glad we didn't try to make that move today. Like there was no market for those moves today. So I think all that considered. I'd give this probably a 10. I was worried the Flames would do nothing. I was worried that they would try, sort of what you're saying and go, well, we can win. Let's not move anybody. Let's try this. And then we lose out on a bunch of assets. I think they got better than what I thought, even though they didn't move one guy I wanted them to, which was Ryan. We got better return for the guys that we got rid of. I think it all evens out. I'm going to give this a 10 out of 10. Yeah. I mean, and if, you and if they keep Ryan, then I, I would also make it a 10 out of 10. Like, if they lose him for nothing, then it'd be like, yeah. You, you know what? To me, I I mean, I would like them to, to keep Ryan, but again, I think we can fill that spot with a lot of other guys. I'm not sold that you need to keep Ryan to make this, to change oh, no, this no. trade deadline. No. Um, but yeah, that would be basically my only sticking point. But again, splitting hairs. Like, all so, in all, I think that the team did what they needed to. They didn't now, they need it, to. They didn't. The, they weren't loyal to the guy that I thought maybe they'd be too loyal to in Bennett, and you know, go right down to the wire before he walked. I'm glad that they, they did business. Yeah, and you know, I'm looking forward to Heineman when he gets here. It, no, I don't expect him to play this season, of course, next year or the year after. And you know, the second round pick that'll help. And you know, like especially if the Flames do have to go into a bit of a struggle mode. Mm-hmm for a year or two where you know it will allow like the current prospects the Pettersons, the Phillips to get a long look the Godans, the Rujitskas the Pospisils a look in the NHL and it'll allow the draft picks Peltier and Zari to get to the AHL and future draft picks to start working their way through and if we're bad for a couple of years, that's a okay. You know, like I can, I can totally see one of those picks get moved in the off season in one of our big deals. I could see like, 
or maybe not those picks, maybe one of our picks, but I could totally see it being like Goudreau and Calgary second next year for something. And I wonder if Tree brought in those assets knowing he might need them. Yeah, and more options are better. And It's currency. Yeah, exactly. And at this point, it's about fi- finding a new mix. And, you know, it's not ideal. And none of this is the ideal situation, but the Flames as a whole need to maximize the returns. And I think that the Flames maximize the returns for both Bennett and Riddick, and that's wonderful. Good, you've got some extra guys in. Now, next steps. And next steps and next steps. Let's talk about those next steps. You were mentioning changing up sort of the dynamic and the guys here. Five new players um, within the Flames organization this week. Two call-ups and three new guys to the organization. But after today's deadline, the Flames announced Adam Ruzicka got recalled from Stockton or the room three doors to the left because it's not really from Stockton. It's from the Calgary, the Stockton heat of Calgary. Um, and Artem Zagadulin also recalled both guys in the taxi squad for right now. So I'm imagining, based on what we've heard, Deming is the uh, starter Zagadulin becomes the backup. Makes me wonder what they're going to do in Stockton. Um, Parsons is back and healthy, so he probably takes the net there. And I have no idea who backs him up, but we'll uh, we'll figure that out down the road. Um, Rajishka, though, I think while he's on the taxi squad, you don't bring him up to stay on the taxi squad. I think he will probably slot into Bennett's roster spot. What do you think? Yeah, I'm figuring that like in a couple of... I, I would probably give Rajishka a week to practice with the the NHL team to just get used to like an NHL practice and then I think it ta- I think you take him on the road trip and then decide by the 19th yeah. what you want to do with him. Yeah. I'm I'm sure he will play many games the rest of the way. Like I'm I would bet on 10 or more than less. And I think that you need to give him a shot. I think that like especially like if the things do crater in the next few days um, that you'll start to see guys like Phillips get a shot and Patterson get a shot and, you know, Mackie being recalled. You might even, like, if depending on uh, his season, Wolf might get a shot. Parsons, I think, will get a game or two. Like, you might as well cycle everybody in their kitchen sink through here, you know, at that rate. Yeah, no, for sure. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about the coming week. But I totally agree with you. Once they're out, and I think by next week, I mean, you've said you'd give this team five more games. So I think by next week, we know for sure where this team stands. Um, I definitely think as soon as they're out, they start bringing those guys in. And as you said, sitting guys out. And I still think that Markstrom might be hurt. And I wouldn't be opposed once we're out, if he is hurt, to sitting him down and getting his surgery going early. So he can start that recovery and give the net to... Deming yeah. Zagadulin or Deming Parsons or somebody like that. Well, same here. Like with Sean Monahan, like he his wrist is obviously screwed well, up. That's so it. like yeah. as soon as he's done, like or the flames are done, then shut him down and just you know, and that, that goes for anybody who's got any injuries requiring surgery. Just sit them down, bring kids up. Who cares at that point? And because it's not going to make any difference. So, the Flames yeah. made three signings this week, along with all these trades and call-ups. Uh, two that were in the system and one that wasn't. The first one that we brought up was Yan Kuznetsov, who uh, he's been playing in Russia. He's born in Russia. Uh, 19-year-old defenseman, left shot, big boy, he's 6'4", 216, which is a bigger defenseman than we usually see in the Flames system. Um, he's been playing in the University of Connecticut, even though he's Russian. Uh, played for the Russian U-17, U-18 team played this year in the NCAA and now it sounds like he's on his way to Stockton on a part-time tryout agreement so this was um, for those that don't know our second round pick number 50 overall last year so good to see him getting into the organization and I guess turning pro after what what, two years in the NCAA in uh, University of Connecticut but you you were high on Kuznetsov last year I think this is probably a, a good guy to get going in the system we need some defensive prospects and I think yeah. Kuznetsov will, will um, look good there. Yeah, Kuznetsov is basically a defensive defenseman uh, who's physical, and he just plays an adequate game offensively. I, I would never expect him... Uh, basically, Chris Tanev's level of offense. Like, he he's there. <laughs> uh, might make a pass here and there, might make a shot here and there, but not going to be anybody that you're going to rely on to generate the offense. He's the guy who clears the 
players out of the front of the net. And the Flames have lacked size and willingness to from their defenders to move guys out. And From what I've heard, people have said he could be our next Derek England. Yeah, which that would be A-OK. Like, it, realistically, the Flames, as they move forward, they need to get some defensemen that... Like, they, they have a... They've had a lot of guys like over the last six seven eight years like heading back to like kulak and kalkin and way back when um where like they're drafting guys that were all the two-way mold like tj brody and mark giordano and realistically like other than keegan kanzig like they didn't really draft anybody that had size that could actually move people out of the front of the net and I think that that's been an element that's been lacking, frankly, since the Flames had Robin Regeer, is that just that raw physical guy that will just, you know, make it hard for you to go and r- crash the net. And, like, Derek England did a good job, but the Flames need to have guys that can actually play, like, top four minutes that have that element, not just being the depth guy. And I think Kuznetsov has enough overall where he could be a solid 3-4 guy who does the banger mode type guy and we'll see uh you know it it's a good pick and good good signing he just needs more time and all that and getting him to Stockton right away will fast track that a bit and I think that you know like I wouldn't be shocked if a year from now he makes his NHL debut not for very much, but like Connor Mackey's flirtation <laughs> earlier. This we just year. had a lot of sort of tweener defensemen the last couple of years, um, and I think that it's good to start getting some of our our young guys. Not these free agents that we're signing, but some young guys in there. And another defenseman too that we brought up was Elias Soloviev uh, this week, and uh, seventh round pick last year. Um, what was that? That would have been two oh five, I think, in the seventh round. Um, for the Flames in 2020. He's 20. He's a defenseman, 6'2", 189, so another big boy. He's from Belarus. Um, Sort of an interesting path. If you look at him, he's played for Belarus a lot in World Juniors and whatnot. Played one year in the OHL for the Saginaw Spirit. Got 40 points in 53 games. And then this year, played in the KHL and got nine points in 41 games. So a guy who's playing at some high-level hockey in in the K but another another big defenseman, which, like you said, I think the Flames need yeah. to get both these guys and going. He's on. more he's more of the uh, more traditional Flames defenseman, uh, the TJ Brody ish mold of a two way guy. Not I'm imagining this K deal is only a one year, so they can bring him over. Yeah, that would be my guess at twenty. My guess yeah. is he just went home and he played there because he couldn't get back here. Yeah. I think it was just a COVID situation that he decided. That's to what I mean. Home. Yeah, yeah. Um, so two two defensemen in the system, and then the the next one, and a guy that the Flames like to do this more than I think a lot of teams went out and signed sort of an, a never really that heard of um, college player, Walker Doer from the uh, Minnesota State University NCAA. He's a right winger, right shot, which we need. Twenty three years old from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, he's been playing for University of um, well Minnesota State University for uh, four years. So started there in 2017, 2018, and put up okay numbers for NCAA. Uh, he, I've been told he's a power forward. Is how a lot of people have described yeah, him. Yeah, and a, a lot. Uh, the main comparison I've heard is Garnett Hathaway, and frankly, the Flames could use that type of guy. Yeah. So, and like this is why back like when I was advocating a difference with how the Flames are drafting, like it's far easier just to sign guys that are showing For sure. that instead of you know wasting a fifth or a sixth round pick on that mold of a player and hoping that they develop into. And and I mean even Garnet Hathaway, we probably all agree has done better than we expect him to. I think this guy will probably be like a Luke Philp type of comes in probably has a good minor league career, maybe gets a cup of coffee at some point. Um, I mean, if he has the upside of Hathaway, great. I think that he'd be he'd be fantastic and probably be more than happy with his career if he did. Yeah, exactly. Like, if he makes the NHL, it'll be as a fourth-line banger-type guy who is a physical presence and might chip in the odd point. But 
Yeah, that's basically. I mean, I, I look at this guy as a as a great piece for either the Stockton Heat or the Kansas City. Uh, what are they called? Pretty uh, much, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. The horse logo. I don't even know their team name, but Kansas City team. Yeah. Um, our ECHL affiliate. Now I need to look it up because it's it's bugging me. They are I oh the Mavericks. I th- I was gonna say the Renegades or something. It's the horse logo has nothing to do with what they are. I, uh, first thing that came to my head was the Stampeders when I saw when I thought yeah. of the horse logo. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Again, another depth guy. Just another guy to fill contract spots. Um. Nothing wrong with that deal. I'm perfectly happy with that. And we'll see if we ever see him here in Calgary. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, you know, and you need filler guys, and like I, I that's why like I much rather go this route of signing that that archetype of guy instead of wasting draft picks. And you know, like to Flames credit, they've been uh, drafting more finesse skill guys, and you know they are getting returns from that instead of just you know drafting physical guys that you never hear i agree there's enough nc double a free agents and you know even i mean canadian like luke philp from canadian universities even undrafted overaged uh canadian hockey league guys there's enough guys if you want filler go go get the filler for free yeah don't waste an asset on them yeah i totally agree with your assessment there yeah well, I think that is the end of the week for the Flames. Uh, lots of signings, couple of trades. Now we've got to win some games, and that's uh, that's all they've got left to do this coming week, Matt. Yeah, well, you know, or alternatively, lose a lot of games, depending on your perspective of, hey, draft pick, yay. <laughs> you know what, though? With the current lottery system, even losing a lot of games, you're not guaranteed anything. Yeah, like realistically, as long as the Flames are picking, like if – Unless they make the playoffs, as long as they're picking in the top ten, that's great. I'm not a fan of tanking. Enough. I think even if they're out, I want these guys to play as professionals and yeah. and still, you know, do what they need to do. Yeah, exactly. And frankly, and especially, especially if we want to move some of these assets, I think we still need them to look good. Yeah, exactly. And we'll see. I I'm not. Yeah. Like have you, uh, ideally, like they go and they win every game, so that way they can get back into the playoff push. But yeah, well, between now and the next time we talk, we have three games the Flames have to win. It's a bit of a road trip. Three games. They'll probably be on the road all week. I imagine they'll come back Saturday or Sunday. Um, but we will play tomorrow night, Tuesday night, five thirty p.m. Calgary time, against Toronto in Toronto. Then Wednesday, the back to back, five p.m. at Montreal. And then Friday, 4 p.m. start time at Montreal. So some early games here for the Flames on the road. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about these games first. What do you think the probability is that David Riddick starts for Toronto? And since he won't have Toronto pads, where is his Calgary pads against Calgary and Toronto? Yeah, I'm assuming that he will be playing because, you know, unless there was an actual stipulation. Yeah, Tim or Jack Gamble. You know, a stipulation of, hey, don't play that guy. Um, which I don't think there is. Well, and even then, then you totally can't make would. that an official situation. It's like some of these guys have talked to Francis. They can't make official deals not to take somebody. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would expect Riddick to play, and it'll be weird. It'll be very weird. You know what and they should do? They should have Riddick lead the Flames on the ice and just skate to the other side and then have Markstrom come out and do circles with our guys. Yeah. Well, that, that and, you know, like him take off a Flames jersey and it's a Leafs jersey underneath Well, it. Pro- he'll probably be wearing his Flames colors with the Leafs jersey, which I always find funny after deadline day when you got a guy wearing blue with, like, oh, red yeah. pads it, and stuff like, like that. It's uh, like Cujo when he got here and he was wearing yeah. Coyotes colors and you never well, really Coyotes colors it. are fairly close. Yeah. Or uh, I, Backstrom when he, I think he wore green pads one game and... Yeah. It's just odd, but yeah. It, I don't know. reddick has got a long time to get Toronto. Maybe he'll paint them while he's on the highway. Who knows? Yeah. Um, so we got that one. And then we have a back-to-back with Montreal. Do you play Markstrom in both those games just because we need the win? Or do you give Domingue or someone else the net in Montreal? Well, I think that you're going to end up seeing the Flames actually try to win these games. Like where... Playoff just these games. None of the other ones this season. Just these no, ones. No, no. Well, 
get going for the playoff push and like trying to give it their 100%. And whether that actually turns out or not, we'll see. Or they'll just be bad then who cares. Like you know, it it's one of those where I think you just got to run with your full lineup, you know, full tilt. And so that's your long way of saying you'd play Riddy or you'd play Markstrom, Markstrom in both these games. Yeah, and just let it rip. And after this week, I think you'd, you know, like, if you lose both Montreal games, you, you, yeah, you're done. And you start sending vets to IR time and, you know, if they need to and just shut things down and kid time and. Going into Toronto tomorrow, would you play the same lines that we saw in the five yes. nothing win against yes. Edmonton? Yep. And do you kind of play those lines yep. from now until the end? Until they're out, basically. Let it rip. And so that's so that's your new lineup. Yep. Might as well. Or at least the majority of it. I mean, I look at that line. I say I wouldn't touch the top three. I'd be okay to take you know Brett Ritchie out and put someone else in, but I think yeah. at least the the top nine and the and you know the the top let's call it one two three four five. Actually, I'd probably say all six defensemen. I wouldn't touch. So with that in mind, Matt, we got uh, the back to back and one against Montreal. What's your prediction for this week? Uh, zero points. <laughs> we need a win, but we don't think they're gonna win. I, I no. love this anticlimactic story from you. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, I, I have zero faith in these players. So yeah, zero. Uh, I think that they're just. <laughs> You've been the to... one saying all night, "This is the week they got to win," and then it comes down to this, and you, you're like the biggest heel there is. Like I know they need to win, but they're not gonna do it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you spent all night telling us this is the week. You got me pumped up, Matt, and yeah, now you're well, telling me they're not gonna do it. This is like false advertising. Well, it, it's one of those things. You have the expectations, the hopes, the wants. But, you know, you have to be realistic. and. But you're yeah. a Flames fan, and you know it's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, well, you know, in a lot of ways, like, this season reminds me a lot of, like, the 2012-2013 season when we first got going doing this show, where it's just, you know, running out the string, and, you know, we'll see. Uh, you know, like, I'm... There, there's still some life there, but... Yeah. I think that these guys are done. I don't think they make it. I'm going to no. be a little more optimistic than you. I think they, they win in Toronto because I think these guys want to show. I think they have something to prove after losing Riddick and losing um, um, Sam Bennett. I think they've got something to prove. I think they'll go out. They'll probably beat Toronto um, or come at least get one point against Toronto, and I think they'll lose both to Montreal. I think that we'll, they're just going to run a gas. They always do. Yep. And but, it is what you know. It is what it is at this mm, point. And, and you talked about the five games we needed one against Montreal. For those that don't know, they're all this month. We have two against Montreal this week, two against Montreal next week, and then one against uh, Montreal the week on the twenty sixth. Yeah, so like they're all coming up right away, and like frankly, you know, it, if they actually do manage to win, and you know, like say they get six points this week then it's like, okay, maybe they might actually be alive. Maybe. And then, let's see. But even then, so you're going to the playoffs with a crippled Jacob Markstrom and Louis Domingue. You're not, like, you're not lasting long. Well, it, it's one of those things that if the Flames actually, you know, just in the hypothetical situation of that they pull this rabbit out of their hat and somehow manage to tap into a vein of awesomeness where they just steamroll everybody the rest of the way and like they go 12 and 3 and they're running on full tilt to get to the postseason honestly that would be the one team I wouldn't want to face in the postseason because everything's working for them at that point yeah but you also know their luck's gonna run out sooner rather than later at that point well that happened the first year that uh, Daryl took over LA and then LA won the cup so you know, like, if the Flames do pull it out and get to that point, then any preconceived notion of, oh, well, it's Toronto and they're awesome, or any of the other permutations, like, it it literally is throw the entire regular season out the window, who cares, it, game one, let's go. And, because nothing will have made any sense. 
this whole season will have not made any sense. Anything that we've seen will have not made well, any let, sense. Let's, so. not, let's not even get there yet. Let's, yeah, uh, no, let's, I know. let's wait. But, like, let's that, try to win some games this week. From the guy no, who thinks we're going to lose them all this week. I know. No, I'm just saying that, like, the thought experiment of if, you know, like, then, like, nothing will have made any sense. And so you just have to see what it is. But, you know, odds of us getting to that point are... I think down around 2%. <laughs> and that's probably being kind and optimistic. <laughs> well, let's... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll I, I, pers- I personally think, if, if you think they've still got some life in them, I think the best thing to do is get through this week, let things play out the way that you're going to, which we know is going to be less than 500, and then start looking at other players. Start, as you were mentioning earlier, yeah. bringing in guys from Stockton. Maybe try guys that are already here in different roles. I mean, you know, maybe we start elevating guys at the lineup. Maybe you try, you know, uh, some different guys in different spots. Maybe you try different goalies. But I think it's Shillington, it becomes right winger. <laughs> if if you were the coach, you'd cycle all those guys to the right wing. Yeah. You'd probably put all your defensemen on on wing because they like to convert defense to forward and call up all your Stockton defensemen. Yeah, and hey, then Stone. convert them to wingers too. Hey Stone, maybe you might be just like your brother. Let's go up front. <laughs> It's probably why we didn't bring any defensemen in. Yeah. And if you if you were GM here, no defensemen would want to come here. They'd all have a no trade clause. I want to play for that guy. He'll make me into a winger. Yep. Instead <laughs> of having like a ten team no trade, you'll have a two team. I don't want to go to Winnipeg and I don't want to go play for Matt. Yep. <laughs> Wherever he is, whatever team it's not even a team no trade, it's a GM no trade. Whatever team's employed him, I'm not going there. Yep. Time to yeah, play well, hockey in a completely different fashion, <laughs> where nothing makes right. any sense. <laughs> you'll get you'll get some G, you'll get some defenseman like a Chris Russell who his agent calls him and says, "Well, we got one offer. Where uh, from that team that Matt runs? Look at the KHL. Yeah, you'd rather much. go over there. Or look at the Japanese pro league instead of going to play for Matt because that man wants to make me a winger. Yep, exactly." All right, Matt. Well, let's see if any defensemen become wingers this week and watch take us out as you always do. Well, as always, whether it's in the short term or the long term, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.